Oh, it's Ed. And for an, and welcome to another episode of Histories All Right, <laughs> where we do writing and talk about how history can help us make better writing. Mm. And of course, it's Pride Month. As you might know, I came out in my last video, but uh, now we're going to be a bit more general. But uh, that's fine. And you see, it's almost a bit timely, this episode, because you see, this morning, I discovered news of Netflix's Q-Force program. Or at least, the release of its trailer. I was not impressed. Just so many queer stereotypes, and I was just thinking... Now, I need, I'd just like to say a couple things about this and then move on. First, we've only seen the trailer. It is quite possible that the show will be different. Second. I'm leaving a link to the trailer in the description so that you check for yourself. For, after all, we're still, this is still something we're doing, we're still looking like historians, even if in my case we're a feeble imitation of a historian, but we're still looking at this, analysing facts, so we should take a look at the evidence ourselves and not jump to conclusions based on hearsay and, you know, what other people say and other people's reactions. So, basically... I've put the link in the description so you can get a more rounded view. Although, we're going to now move on from Q-Force. Because, funnily enough, there's actually a better way of representing queer characters. I'm just going to uh, praise the TV show The Rookie at this point. I'd just like to thank the writers of The Rookie for writing a gay character that, well, in a way, what they wrote was a character who is gay. The fact that he's gay is not in any way hidden, but also not his one defining trait. Funnily enough, he's actually in some ways an opposite of a gay stereotype because he's a tad brash, although this is for totally unrelated reasons. I watch the show and find out I don't want to give too much away. It's a good show and worth watching. Watching if you, you know, like that sort of buddy cop drama kind of thing. And so, enjoy. Uh, but, uh, well, I also have a slightly interesting take from history. Because, you see, maybe I should now let you know about uh, Pride and, you know, why I personally think that the rookie represents its gay character very well. 
Because you see, queers are not sort of like got out for one month of the year. Yeah, so like parading through the streets, eats, waving the banners, and just and then just locked back in the closet by Canada Day. Just so happens that Canada Day is the first of July. No, 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 no. Queers exist. We walk the streets. We are in your workplace. We're in the workplace. Not your workplace. That sounds very much like a 1950s scaremonger film. <laughs> no, we're in the workplace. Places of worship. Yes, yeah, some of us are. Are and uh, And you know what? Because in a way, Pride's about celebrating who we are. And then the rest of the time, and hopefully allowing us to live. And just be. Oh, and that's the queer agenda, by the way. Just be. And, uh, you know what? I personally believe that the queer agenda can liberate straight people as well. You might, now that might sound a bit strange because a lot of them aren't, I mean, you know, it's not like there's been a, I mean, there isn't some kind of history of violence against heterosexuals, murder of heterosexuals, you know, nothing like that. But society still puts expectations upon people. I mean, you just have to look at the subreddit, are the straights okay? Which, one, represents a tiny minority of straight people. But the reason it exists is because there is a lot of anxiety. You know, people feel like they have to perform a straightness in the same way that uh, queerness gets performed as well. Whereas being, you know, allowing each other to be and just live without being shoved into a box based on just one facet of our being I mean, <laughs> after all, that, uh, after all, you might have heard, you know, the sort of traditional gender roles you've heard about, you know, the man goes out and wins the bread for his family and the woman stays home and uh, makes the house for him, you know, that sort of thing. Ah, hi, big manly man going out and doing the work and... Uh, then the woman, and then he comes home and his wife has got everything on the table and she's been working the stove and all that. And uh, yes, there is a common belief that this is traditionally how things worked. And history shows us otherwise. History, I mean... There's a sort of grain of truth, but of course, well, you know, well, they say the, uh, you know, the most convincing miss, myths, the most convincing myths start out from a grain of truth. After all, no one would believe it if it was just based on a complete pack of lies. But, one thing, I mean, take for example, medieval life. The, if you, for your nobles, of course, the women didn't work, neither did their husbands. They inherited from the land. 
they adjudicated, they do all that sort of stuff. Stuff they... And, uh, and yes, there was, they were sort of part of that those who fight category, but often they'd hire knights to do that. They'd have knights to do that for them. And, uh, plus they were a tiny minority of the population. Most of the people were part of the, were of the peasants. Those who worked, as they were often known in the medieval era. And you know, in harvest time, whole families, indeed whole villages, man, woman, child, every other, you know, man, woman, every gender out there, child, I... You know, work, gender identity is a bit complicated, and we'll put a pin in that and get back to that later. Point is, everyone was doing the work. Most work in those days was labour intensive. It required a lot of people. The kids would do things like moving stones that might break the plow plow they might carry bales and stuff like that while the mums and the dads would uh, harvest and uh, even in the home home while the m home you might have heard you know the woman would weave cloth and but the thing is one thing that people often misunderstand is that going out to work and looking after the home were more intertwined in this era. So that cloth that was being spun, what they weren't using, would be used to generate income either through being given to the Lord as part of their rent or sold directly. So essentially the home of a medieval family also acted as part of that workspace especially for the peasantry obviously whereas when we see a middle class develop around about the age of pike and shot so from 1400 onwards as labor saving devices become more extant and then ubiquitous we start seeing this gradual shift whereby the home isn't so much used as the place of business although even later on a draper's shop may well be in someone's home. I mean, that's just an example, I believe, from my own family, from my own family history, but uh, well, Lancashire. I... Yeah, well, my nan used to breed dogs. But, uh, so that, <laughs> well, as, as we can tell, female entrepreneurship was quite a ubiquitous part of life even you know into the 20th century in the late 20th century as my mum was still alive well my mum had been born by that what well, by that point yeah so And, uh, you know, speaking of women, uh, we can also, there's also body shape. Hey, you know, the expectation of the body shape of women, men as well. But now let's uh, talk about women, because historically, that ain't always been the same as it is now, or the same as it was until, say, recently, when body acceptance started to grow. That sort of 
slender figure. I mean, now I'm uh, gonna say so I'm now gonna sing some thin and uh, apologies to every southerner here, but I promise you, it is relevant from a soul. <clears throat> and a big fat Dutch girl's hat. Hand out the bradium, hand it out the bradium, hand it out the bradium. The big fat Dutch gals, hand it out the bradium. And bully boys, see, bully boys, ho, if you want to have a good time, join the cavalry, join the cavalry, join the cavalry. And I won't subject you to any more. I should have apologised to everyone for my singing. Now, <laughs> what? Now that is from a Confederate's, from a Confederate Army song during the United States, during the US Civil War, which was from 1861 to 1865 for anyone who didn't know. Ooh. Mm. No. So, either we can draw the conclusion that uh, the Confederates were somehow some kind of sexually liberated people, <laughs> you know, checkmate Lincolnites, and apologies to Attenche Films for that terrible impression of Johnny Reb, but... Uh, we can also look a bit more accurately uh, at various paintings of the era, you know, era, such as uh, Renoir. You, I've left the links in the description because, uh, art, because despite the fact that it's art, YouTube may be a little bit upset if I showed pictures of naked ladies. Just saying. <laughs> so you can scroll down to that, to the nude section of the Renoir article. And we see women who are larger but they are presented beautifully, magnificently. We can see this in other paintings as well, other artists as well. I mean, one only has to look at Venus in the Mirror by Rubens. I've also left a link to Rubens' artwork in the description. <coughs> and, uh, well, we can tell that it wasn't particularly common to idealise women being very thin. In fact, we see a lot more art and body types in art down the centuries. It's somewhat more recent that we've started seeing the sort of idea of a woman, you know, a nice fin after all, <laughs> even in the 1860s as we heard earlier, sort of good time song about having a good time with the cavalry, finding big fat Dutch gals, referring to the Pennsylvania Dutch in case you're wondering, you know, something Something the old southern boys be looking forward to. Two big women. <laughs> well. And, uh, hey. Turns out, historically speaking, a lot of people liked different things. And, uh, speaking of which, let's talk a little bit about, uh, the concept of sexuality. Interestingly enough, the idea of 
heterosexual and homosexual was not a universal throughout history. In ancient Rome, sexuality, especially of men, for example, was seen more as a, either the active or the passive. Similar to the idea of being a bottom or a top these days. Although not as literally, you understand. Hmm. You know, the idea that a man, you know, a man could be with another man and he wouldn't be seen as any less masculine if he was the one in control of the relationship, you know. It wasn't seen as masculine to be the sort of submissive partner, but if you were the dom, if you were the dominant, that was sort of how the Romans saw it, you know. Guys could be with other guys, I mean, let's face it, in ancient Greece there was also the sort of idea of a, a hoplite might be with other men while on campaign. There was a whole whole unit of it known as the Sacred Band of Corinth. The idea that uh, you would not wish to look cowardly in front of your lover. So you bring your lover with you. You'd stand with you so that you would not want to run away and look like a weed in front of him. Yeah, you know, when you're in your phalanx. That yeah, that's uh, one way of doing it. I'm not saying that ancient societies were super tolerant or anything. Yes. But still, just a bit of food for thought. And, uh, well, so we can see from a few examples from history... When writing sexualities, one of the best things to do is think about the context of your world. Does it have to be within a strict binary? Perhaps your society doesn't see a strict binary. There are. You know, multiple societies throughout history have had ideas of a third gender. I mean, Funnily enough, funnily enough, you even see things like that, that even in medieval Europe, in a way, because as it, the sort of ascetic path, path in, the med, in medieval Europe, was open to men and women, you know, monks and nuns did exist. exist and uh, in that sense it was a pretty unisex role role in society not to mention the sort of androgynous nature of being a worker anyway you know a peasant you know when you were going to work you all went out to work Pardon me. As we said, labour intensity was based on the family unit. Because of how intense labour was, the workplace was the family unit. Hmm. Yes. So that's probably the best way of, one of the best things to do when, write, when looking at uh, writing queer characters. Think about the context they live in, and uh, think, 
we can be broad-minded, we can be, you know, perhaps we can have a broader or narrower, the, and sometimes if it's not a major part of the story, after all, if you're writing an action, combat kind of story where romance doesn't really feature much, Mummy, you can be less romantic. Although it probably doesn't look very good to just say, oh, they were gay all along afterwards. It's probably a better look to be honest with people, let people know what they're into, what they're in for. For and just remember, when you're world building, you can have variety. Well, uh, I think I've gone on for a. I think I've gone over everything that I needed that uh, was good to go over. <laughs> I'd just like to thank you and happy Pride Month out there. And uh, I know you can keep it going after Pride if you wish. You know, queers don't cease to exist after. On the end, at the end of June thirtieth, and then don't just m magically come back into existence on June the first. So uh, enjoy and uh, thank you for being supportive. And it was lovely having you here. <laughs>